This is the IELTS listening test. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between an assistant librarian and a woman who wants to use the internet in the library. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Good morning. I'd like to register to use the internet in the library. Do you have a library card? Yes. I've been a member for six months, but I've never used the internet services before. No problem. Can I have your full name, please? Linda Jane Milton. So, Milton is your surname? Yes. And Linda, L-I-N-D-A? Well, no, actually, it's L-Y-N-D-A. Linda, Jane. And, um, Jane isn't spelt J-A-N-E either. It's J-A-Y-N-E. OK, got that. Thank you. Now, where do you live, Linda? Unit 15, 35 Maximilian Way. That's in Whitfield, right? I have a cousin who lives in that area. Yes, Whitfield. And the postcode is 7755. Not quite. You've got it round the wrong way. It's 5577. Whoops. OK. Moving on now. Do you work or are you at home during the day? Well, both, actually. I work as a nurse, but I'm on permanent night shift. Oh, I see. In that case, we won't put down your home phone number because I'm sure you don't want to be disturbed when you're trying to sleep. Thanks. I appreciate that. You can always leave a message on my mobile if you have to contact me. I have it turned off when I'm sleeping, but I regularly check my voicemail for messages. And that number is? 0412-214-418. Good. Now, I'll need to see some form of photo ID. Have you got something with you? Yes, just a minute. Here's my swipe card for the hospital. Thank you. I just need to make a note of the number. AZ1985331. Is that all you need? Just one more thing, your date of birth. But I can get that from the card. One moment. Look, I'm afraid you haven't copied it down correctly. I was born on the 25th September 1975. What have I written? Oh, yes, I see it now. I've got the 25th of the 8th month, but that would make it August. Thanks for spotting the mistake. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now, listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Well, that's the application form done. Now, I wonder if you'd mind taking part in a survey we're doing. That's fine. What do you want to know? Basically, we're trying to find out why people access the internet. I mean, what would you be using it for? Social networking, I suppose. I don't really think so. I haven't got the time for something like that. But I do want to keep in touch with friends and family, both here and abroad. So I'd mostly be making use of my email account. I see. A lot of students come in here to do research. Is that something that you might be doing? I think the internet is a great tool for research, but it's not something that interests me at the moment. What about checking out a new job? A lot of my friends use the internet for job hunting and they say it's the best way to look for a new position. I'm quite settled where I am, though. You can get access to the other classifieds, can't you? Trade and exchange, that kind of thing? 
Yes, and I'm told it's a very popular way of buying and selling these days. Well, I'll definitely be using it for that. Thanks a lot. Now, do you have any questions? Is there a charge for the service? It used to be free, but we've decided to set a one-off payment of $15 for the initial registration. Oh, that's not bad at all. One more thing. Is there a time limit for each session, like half an hour or something? Oh, it's better than that. One 60-minute session per day. Quite generous, really. But we're very strict about it. I'd rarely spend more than 45 minutes on the Internet at any one time, so that'll be more than enough. Thank you. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a committee member giving a talk to a nature club about coming events. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi everyone. It's good to see such a big turnout at our Nature Club session for June. Just before we start this evening's workshop, I'd like to draw your attention to what we have in store for you in the second half of the year. First of all, the guided bushwalk. This is always a favourite starting out on the Springvale Plateau and continuing down into a section of the State Conservation Area. Last year, we invited children aged eight and over if they came with a parent, but the track has been washed out in a few places since then and it can be quite rough. So, this year we considered restricting it to adults only. However, on reconsideration, the committee has now decided to recommend it for all bushwalkers who are over the age of 12. Another very popular option is the bird observation walk. We'll be searching for both migratory and native birds as we walk through tidal marshlands and mangroves and you can expect to get your feet uncomfortably wet and muddy if you don't wear rubber boots. These are a must. The leader will have a strong pair of binoculars, so we'll rely on her to name the species for us. And we've ordered some bird identification books that you may wish to purchase at a later date. From the bush to the swamp and now to the sand dunes. Our leader will help us identify plants native to the local area as well as some invasive weed species. We'll be asking for volunteers to help pull out the weeds where possible, so a pair of sturdy gardening gloves is essential. Spades and other tools will be provided. It could get very hot and you'll need water, plenty of it, but a local business owner is willing to provide bottled water free of charge. The next outing, Bush Tucker, is a new one. 
Have you ever wondered what life in this country would have been like 200 to 2,000 years ago? Well, come on this trip and you'll find out how the indigenous inhabitants used local plants as food and medicine. Because lunch is included in this trip, there will be a small charge per person. We had originally thought $7 would cover the basics, sausages and bread followed by tea and coffee, but then we thought a few different cuts of meat and salad would be nice and that brought the price up to $12 a head. At one stage, we even contemplated including seafood, but that would have been a bit too expensive, around $15, so meat and salad it is. We expect this to be a popular event, so we'll need advance bookings to organise the catering. Please let us know your intentions by the 10th of November, and be aware that we'll require prepayment by the 15th of November. You can still change your mind and get a refund up to the 25th of November, but after that date, if you pull out, you'll forfeit the money paid. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Well now, if you can give me a few more minutes of your time, I'll fill in a few details for you. The bushwalk, led by Glen Ford, is first up in July, on the second of the month. It'll start from Springvale as usual, but this year we'll be setting off in the morning at 9.15 and we'll get back at 1 in the afternoon. The bird-watching expedition is on the 10th of September at Camford, and the leader is the president of the Nature Club, our very own Joy Black. If you have any questions at all about bird life, Joy is the person to ask. This is a twilight outing from 4.30 to 6.30. Next up is the trip to the sand dunes on the 26th of November with Rex Rose. A bit of an early start, especially for those of you with a fair way to travel, but we'll meet at the observation hut at half past eight. That's the observation hut, 8.30 till 10.30. And even at that time of the morning, it'll be very hot, so come prepared. The last trip on the program is the Bush Tucker excursion on the 3rd of December with Ranger Jim Kerr. This will be at Carson Hills, and the presentation and demonstration will take place from 10 a.m. till 11.30, but be prepared to stay on for the barbecue and bush tucker lunch at 12 o'clock. I expect we'll wind up at 2, and you can head for home at that time. Well, that's all I have to tell you. A booklet will be mailed out to you later with those events, dates and times, but don't wait, put them on your calendar now. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a conversation between a science tutor and two first-year students who are being given some practical tips for conducting experiments. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Now, Vincent and Tessa, I've asked the two of you to come and see me because I'm a bit concerned after that incident in the science lab last week. I realize that neither of you have had much experience in a laboratory before. Well, we mostly just studied theory at high school. And we rarely got the opportunity to carry out any experiments. Fair enough. But we must all abide by certain safety procedures. The last thing we want is for one of our students to get hurt. We understand that. Our priority is to make sure that the chemistry laboratory is a safe place and actually, accidents can easily be prevented if you just think about what you're doing at all times. It sounds simple enough. It is if you always use good judgment, observe safety rules, and follow directions. We've read the rules on the poster inside the lab. And yet last week you were seen working in the lab without eye protection. What do you mean? I was wearing my glasses. Prescription glasses are not safety glasses. You must always wear the goggles provided. You'll find they fit quite comfortably over your ordinary glasses. Oh, I see. Just make a habit of putting them on before you start and keep them on until you are finished. And another thing, never eat or drink while in the laboratory. What? Not even water? Not even water. At least not until after cleanup. Then be sure to wash your hands thoroughly with soap and hot water and dry them on a clean towel first. And Tessa, your hair should be tied back when you're in the lab. It's not that long. Still, it poses a hazard when you're working with chemicals or a naked flame. If you can't tie it back or pin it up, see if you can tuck it into a cap or something. Yes, I can do that. Thank you. Now, Vincent... Last week, you wore a T-shirt and trainers in the lab. The rules clearly state that long-sleeved shirts and leather shoes must be worn. Oh, yes, I remember. I was late getting back from sports practice and I didn't have time to change. Well, it mustn't happen again. OK, I'll see that it doesn't. Good. As for the rest of the safety precautions, refer to the safety poster inside the lab and you shouldn't have any problems. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, before you go, a word about record keeping. Oh, good. I was going to ask you about that. What's the best way to keep track of what we're doing in the lab? Well, obviously, all your observations should be written down. I know you think you won't forget stuff and you'll be able to recall it later, but generally this turns out not to be the case. Written data, however, are a permanent record, and you must be thorough. Organise and record everything in a bound notebook. I use a spiral notebook. And I use a large notepad. That won't do. A book with binding ensures the pages are not easily removed or lost. Oh, and be sure to write your entries in complete sentences. Isn't that a waste of time? Surely notes are good enough. You might think so. But brief notes can be hard to decipher at a later date. Whereas with full sentences, you are less likely to misinterpret data. I make sketches, you know, simple drawings. That's a good idea, Vincent, but be sure to date them. You want us to write the date next to each drawing? Yes. Every sketch and every entry must be dated. What about headings? Use the title of the experiment as your first entry. When you have completed your observation entries, answer any questions that have been posed, and then, finally, write your conclusion. How do we write a conclusion? Do we need to repeat things like the questions and our findings, or the time it all took? Just write your own ideas or feelings about the experiment as the conclusion. Oh, and remember to sign it. 
Well, that's all I have time for today. If you have any questions, ask the lab assistant or come back to me. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a lecture on climate change. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. This lecture in environmental studies is on the topic of human influence on climate change. First, I'll outline some of the factors affecting climate, then go on to discuss what has already occurred, and finish up by speculating on the effects. Previously, We've covered how factors such as ocean currents and prevailing winds affect climate change naturally. However, the influence of human activity on climate is what I'll talk about today. At first, the effect on the climate was relatively small. Trees were cut down to provide fuel for fires, and, as we know, trees absorb carbon dioxide and produce oxygen so the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would have increased, but not noticeably. So, in what ways has human activity really impacted on the climate? A major contributor was the advent of the Industrial Revolution at the end of the 18th century, combined with the invention of the combustion engine. In addition, Earth's burgeoning population has had a marked effect on climate. The first two factors, saw increased amounts of carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels, such as coal and oil. The final one, human expansion, has resulted in deforestation on such a scale that the extra carbon dioxide in the air cannot be soaked up and converted into oxygen by the remaining trees. Okay, so what has already happened? Well, Global temperatures have risen by 0.6 degrees Celsius in the last 130 years. Levels of carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide gases have escalated. Carbon dioxide concentrations have climbed by 30%, and methane levels have increased by 145% since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Gas, produced by fossil fuel extraction, livestock, and paddy fields is primarily responsible for the growth of methane levels. Nitrous oxide, or N2O, comes from natural sources, wet tropical forests, for instance. But it is also produced by human-related activities, such as agriculture, which uses synthetic nitrogen fertilizers, rubbish disposal systems, and vehicle emissions. How do gases like carbon dioxide and methane affect the climate? Well, this is what we call the greenhouse effect. Under normal conditions, the sun's rays hit the Earth and some are reflected back into space. However, these gases, CO2 and methane, create a barrier in the atmosphere, which prevents a proportion of the sun's rays from being reflected back into space. And, instead, the gases become trapped in the atmosphere. It's simple, really. Because the sun's rays can't escape, the Earth heats up. What are the possible effects? Firstly, 
a rise in sea levels. We already know that the Arctic ice cap has melted and shrunk considerably, and great chunks of ice have been lost from Antarctica. In 1998, it was reported that 46 million people lived in areas at risk of flooding, and the number of people at risk will increase significantly if sea levels rise. It is estimated that a rise of only 50 centimeters would put that number at 92 million. Further projections would see a rise of one meter put 118 million people in danger of losing their homes and livelihoods, not to mention the loss of prime fertile farmland. Experts predict a rise of at least 50 centimeters over the next 50 years or so. Secondly, there would be a modification of vegetation zones with changes in the boundaries between grassland, shrubland, forest, and desert. This is already causing famine in arid areas of northeastern Africa and has instigated, and will continue to instigate, mass movements of people away from dry regions. What we are seeing now is only the first stage, with temporary camps for climate refugees already at overcapacity. In the future, there will be significant migration resulting in extreme overcrowding of towns and cities. Another potentially disastrous effect of climate change is an increase in the range and distribution of pests which could bring about an increase in the prevalence of certain diseases. If we think of the malaria-carrying mosquito, for example, which thrives in warmer regions, at the moment, about 45% of the world's population is exposed to malaria. But, with an increase in temperature, there will be many millions more cases of malaria a year. The last effect I'm going to mention today is the change in ecosystems. Global warming will influence species composition for both fauna and flora, such that some animal species will disappear and others will multiply. And it'll be the same for plants and trees. It is predicted that around two-thirds of the world's forests will undergo major changes of some kind. Scientists also expect deserts will become hotter. And, of course, desertification will continue at an increasingly worrying rate and will become harder, if not impossible, to reverse. What can we do to stop the process? Well, that's the subject of next week's lecture. So, I hope to see you all there. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.